Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the May Joint Societies meeting. That is uh, ASME, SAME, IMRS, and SMP. So, right to our paper, um, which is on uh, engineering ethics. I just might say before getting into all the introductions, this is not the uh, typical subject we have at a meeting like this, but it's obviously very important. And in fact, if, if you want to take a measure of it, for those of us who are professional engineers and licensed as professional engineers, any state that has continuing education requirements has a component for ethics uh, that is required no matter what you do on the technical side. You do have to show that you are keeping abreast of this and keeping focused on this and that it's so critical to our profession as it is others. So we're very fortunate to, tonight to have uh, the author Hendrick, for those of us who know him, Rick Van Hemmen of Martin Ottaway, Van Hemmen and Dolan. That's over a hundred year old company. Uh, in fact, how many years, Rick? 1875, so it'll be uh, a couple of years beyond the Okay, so uh, yeah, uh, uh, we're well beyond that. But, uh, um, but in any event, uh, he's been there since 1988. Ownership over the family of the company. He's president. Uh, he is a graduate of Virginia Tech. We don't hear that so much with the schools we have here, but a very uh, well known uh, marine engineering, naval architecture uh, institution. Uh, he's a fellow of SNAMI. He's also a fellow of the Academy of Forensic Engineers and a member of, this is very interesting, the Ergonomic or Habitability Factors uh, Society. Uh, his work has both uh, been over the years in technical, operational, financial, and forensic engineering. Um, uh, he's a he's a, a an idea a minute kind of guy, and uh, he's not uncommonly uh, involved in work that involves the issue of ethics. So he's going to be presenting his presentation on engineering ethics clashes and crashes. And with that, we'll have a rich. Van Hemmen, come on up. I have a cold, so I might start hacking midway. That's my glass of water is there. Um, uh, this, uh, the, the, the subject is engineering ethics, and it's, um, it's, a, it's a very selfish reason. And it's related to the fact that, as John explained, that ethics is central to engineering but it's also a license requirement, and lo and behold, I discovered that if I present a paper on ethics that I don't have to take the class. <laughs> and, uh, and so um, Alan and I um, had some discussions about that and we decided to do it. Um, uh, the, um, I, I actually, there, there are not a lot of pictures in this, in this presentation. Normally I do presentations about salvage and explosions and crashes and things like that, and it tends to keep people awake. I did the uh, f a test run on this presentation at um, Kings Point just yesterday, and it was at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and it was barely keeping the students awake. So uh, I, I, there are not a lot of pictures. I will skip to the first part quickly, and then hopefully in the end, maybe you can kind of reel back to it and kind of figure out what I was talking about. Um, uh, there's a lot of ethics standards and fundamentals and things we go through in the beginning. And then later on, we'll go to actual cases, and the actual cases probably will be more interesting because then you can have salty dog stories and they will keep people awake. So let me see if we can go on here. Uh, you know, engineering, it's a strange profession, and, and, and the more time I spend in it, the stranger it gets. Um, uh, central to it is that we have great potential to kill people, uh, both on purpose, if we're, um, if we're weapons designers, or uh, by accident, if we're not. Um, and the other thing is that it's very difficult to hide our mistakes that don't work and don't work, and it's just so incredibly obvious. Um, you can go on to that and, and then see all these weird things that I put over here, but the one thing that I enjoy most of all when I think and talk about ethics and engineering is uh, what kind of respect do we get anyway? And, um, and then that's an interesting question because respect really should express itself both in, in, in general respect by the public, but also from a financial point of view. And um, it is not strange to think that engineering at one stage was really the profession to go into from a, point of, uh, from a money point of view. And I'm talking about the era of, um, of uh, Ned Hirschhoff or um, 
or Burnell or uh, Eiffel, people like that, who really ended up on the pinnacle of society and also the pinnacle of income. Um, today that's not the case and we're kind of struggling with it and we'll go into it a little bit. So if you actually look at respect, um, the, here's a graph that was um, produced by um, a study, a social uh, sociology study by somebody at Princeton. Um, I can, it's kind of small, but if you start to look closely, you can see that the engineers are all the way on the right side, which means their competence is the highest of any of the people out there. Um, then the vertical, um, the vertical axis is warmed, and I'm not really sure what that means. Uh, it's done by a sociologist. Um, you know, right, right, competence is really what counts, and then the next thing should maybe be respect, as far as I'm concerned. Now, um, this is again a sociology study where they ask random people to identify what you saw the prostitute, did you, Brian? And <laughs> the way you have to identify, um, uh, where, where random people are asked to identify how they feel about it. And um, you can see that the competence, the, one of the lowest competence worker is a prostitute, and the next lowest there also. I'm not really sure how it's drawn there, but it could be a dishwasher, which I just find incredibly offensive. Um, the um, you know I, I know many great dishwashers, and 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 there are dishwashers that are much better than others. And to judge just one person by that is just not fair. Um, in engineering, we have the same thing. Um, you know, there's a general appearance that engineers maybe are very competent, obviously there. But we here's a big room, and we know many engineers, and we know many that are not competent. And the question is, how do we deal with that? So there was a very famous engineer who was um, in the, in the uh, American pantheon considered to be the, uh, the biggest loser of the crowd, that's Herbert Hoover. Um, we know who Herbert Hoover is, right? He is the president of the United States that kind of led the country into the, the Great Depression. Um, Herbert Hoover actually before that was a brilliant engineer and Herbert Hoover was considered to be so great that people said if nobody can fix it, Herbert Hoover can fix it. And this is no joke. Um, he almost single-handedly prevented Belgium from dying from famine after World War I. Um, there was a major famine threat, and they said, let Herbert Hoover go in there and fix it. And Herbert Hoover did. He was a very famous mining engineer. And coincidentally, his wife was a famous mining engineer, too. She wrote a very famous book of mining engineering that's still being used. Herbert Hoover, in his 50s, was asked to comment on engineering as a profession. They didn't ask him about being a president, I guess but they wanted to know about engineering. Um, here, this is his statement, and it's worth reading, but again, I'm gonna rush it a little bit, and I'll grab the middle of it. The middle of it is, he says, the engineer simply cannot deny that he did it. If his works do not work, he's damned. That is the phantasmagoria, that's a word I practiced. I use it in <laughs> depositions every now and then. That's the phantasmagoria that hunts, haunts his nights and dogs his days. He comes from the job at the end of the day, resolved to calculate it again. He wakes in the night in a cold sweat and puts something on paper that looks silly in the morning. Happens to me all the time. All day he shivers at the thought of the bugs that will inevitably appear to jolt his smooth consummation. I love that consummation word. I wouldn't use it today. But he, uh, um, the, the bottom line is this actually is the nub of it. If you don't wake up at night in a cold sweat, you're probably doing something wrong. And I hear people chuckle, but it's just something you have to spend time with. Uh, so what happened is in the 1920s, um, the engineering profession at its height um, decided to um, put together a license arrangement, which somehow actually didn't make any damn difference because our wages started going down. But they started to put a code of ethics together, and this was driven by something called the National Society of Professional Engineers. Who's, uh, just show of hands, who's familiar with NSBE? He's a very small component of everybody that's here, and that might be good or bad, and it will become apparent in a couple of minutes. But the National Society of Professional Engineers is the engineering society that focuses on licensed engineers. Um, if you put it that way, it also comes down to that it's a society that basically um, has a lot of civil engineers that like keeping a small club of professional engineers and hope that they can draw as much money to themselves as possible. On top of that, um, they have a code of ethics, and from my point of view, their code of, eth code of ethics is um, we're civil engineers, therefore, if there's a traffic jam, we need to build more roads, and we're not going to look at any other ways to solve the problem because we don't know how to build anything else. And this is an interesting thing to consider. If we talk about ferries, or we talk about airplanes, less so, maybe, air maybe trains, but this is a real big deal. Now, the uh, NSP has a code of ethics, and I'm not going to read it to you. It is not, there's nothing wrong with it per se, 
but it, it has the, fundament, the fundamentals, and you can read it, basically says you have to be honest. And then it has the fundamental canons, and um, then it goes to the fine print. <laughs> And they swear, this is where it goes. Now, what I like best about it is that actually at the bottom of the sheet that you can download, you can find it on the NSPE website. Um, there's actually on the bottom it says um, uh, publication number 1102, Copyright National Society of Professional Engineers, All Rights Reserved. I find it just astonishing that you can actually have copyright on a code of ethics. I don't understand that. I just don't understand it. I mean, why would you not want anybody to copy your code of ethics? But anyway, this is what they do. There's more fine print over here, it goes on. Um, and, and, and on the bottom over here, I lifted something out in a note that says that it's actually people, not corporations. Um, there's a reason for that. Um, and I'll get back to it in a minute. But um, I, I enlarged some of the fine print, and I will read it to you. It says, engineers shall advise their clients or employers when they believe a project will not be successful. This is really cool, actually, when you think about it. Um, so I mm, trying to get a bridge built in nowhere in Alaska. Should I advise my client that it's a bridge to nowhere? And undoubtedly, a professional engineer somewhere on that who has been doing that work on it. Engineers shall not complete sign or seal plans and/or specifications that are not in conformity with applicable engineering standards. This just makes me laugh. Um, as we all know, civil engineering consists of the structural code. Does anybody know the structural code? It's a book about that big, and that's all the structures you get to do when you design a building. There's nothing else. Um, try that in naval architecture. So if we're talking about applicable standards, it gets to be a little weird. And um, if the client or employee insists on such unprofessional conduct, such unprofessional conduct. The question is, what is unprofessional conduct? They shall notify the proper authorities and withdraw from further service on the project. Interesting. Um, this is why they have ethics classes that are funded by, or rather organized by NSPE, and they cost about $150 an hour, and you have to have it for your license requirement. Engineers are encouraged to adhere to the principle of sustainable development in order to protect the environment for future generations. Let's read that closely. Engineers are encouraged. How can you have a code of ethics where there's encouragement? It doesn't make any sense. So engineers shall avoid all conduct or practice that deceives the public. We'll get back to that one. It's fascinating. So not everybody has to be a professional engineer. Not everybody has to be a licensed professional engineer. I personally insist that every engineer I have contact with behaves like a professional. But not every engineer shall be a licensed professional engineer. And there is something that is called the in-house exemption, and that's the last item, item five. And really, in the way that the laws were designed for professional licensed engineers is that manufacturers do not have to have a licensed professional engineer on staff. And my question is, why would manufacturers not want that? And maybe somebody can give me an answer. Well, no, they have to behave according to the code of ethics, and that might not really work for business. So uh, there is an issue there, and we'll, we'll find out what's going on. By the way, this particular list of exemptions was developed by a professor, Spinden, of Liberty University. Um, I'm not sure if you guys know what Liberty University is. It's the university, Jerry Falwell School, yeah. We're, we went to Virginia Tech. It's next door, by the way. So. Um, it's, it's Jerry Falwell School, and it's the school where uh, Trump generally does his speeches. Um, the interesting thing is that this paper goes on and it has a large discussion. And, and by the way, I found this paper simply by searching for ethics and engineers. It says the partnership of engineers and businesses for pragmatic reasons here to stay. It not only has been a symbiotic partnership, good for both engineers and business, but it has been good for America. I love that. It has produced many wonderful products that make life more enjoyable, the like of smart cars, smartphones, and smart TVs. Business has prospered as engineers have shown it how to make its products wonderful and smart, and business has rewarded engineers for the favor. Business has rewarded engineers for the favor. I'm not really sure about that. We'll discuss that. But it's, it has come at a high cost for the public and, the, and for engineers. Industry has demanded the likes of the industrial exemption and thereby gain control of the majority of the engineering that occurs daily in the United States. For the public, the price has been the loss of effectiveness of laws intended to protect it from incompetent engineers whose work can kill or destroy. 
Among the fallouts of the industrial exemption has been disaster, oil spills, unsafe automobiles, and exploding spacecraft. For engineers, the price may have been higher. It has lost its profession. In exchange for the partnerships of awards, engineers have ceded to business managers' pension for asking their engineering employees to take over the engineering hats and to fall into step. And that's kind of interesting because there's some stuff that I really kind of agree with and I hope some of you do too. There are also some things that kind of leave you kind of jangling, you know. There's no way that I've been making a lot of money simply working for General Motors as an engineer or for VW for that matter. Um, actually, this is not the whole conclusion because this is uh, Liberty University. There's a final paragraph and I'll put it up over here. Uh, the wisest man to have lived posed long ago a question that is apt for engineers today. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, Jesus asked, yet forfeit their soul? What good has it been for engineering to have gained the bountiful rewards of business, yet to have forfeited its profession? Um, I love religious studies, but to compare engineering with the New Testament to me doesn't make any damn sense. And we'll go a little further and we'll see this. This by is Matthew 16, 26. Um, so uh, we do know there's a reality in engineering. Um, uh, there are problems, and the, this paper alluded to it, and um, uh, the ones that I will drag out right now are a couple of examples. Um, the first example is the VW emission scandal. Uh, who's familiar with that? Show of hands. I'm glad. Um, you know, we're, we're engineers, we know diesels. So, in knowing diesels, um, we know that at a certain stage you have to start dipping urea into the fuel to be able to get your diesel to meet the emissions that are necessary. Somehow VW was not running urea in their engines and it took a long time for other engineering companies even to pipe up and say, what the hell is going on? And meanwhile, this was picked up by an engineering professor in West Virginia, University of West Virginia. He rang the bell and he said, this is not working right. He got a VW test and didn't find out it wasn't working. The question is, how did this happen? And then really we know it was fraud. We know that the, some, somehow engineers were compelled to do something that wasn't true, that was wrong. If you have professional licensed engineers within a commercial company like that, the professional engineers will say, hey, I'm sorry, man, I'm not going to risk my license for your silliness. And this is interesting because in shipping, and there are some King's Pointers here, I don't know if there's any Skylar students here, but um, in shipping this happens. You will at a certain stage get on board your ship, and you're getting ready to leave port, and you say, you know what, we're not going to do it. And this is very important, and the, the defense you have is say, I'm not going to risk my Coast Guard license to do this. So there are real benefits of licensing and ethics, and we'll go a little further on that. The next one that was basically mentioned in the paper was the challenge of disaster. Again, the show of hands challenge of disaster, you're familiar with it. It's the space shuttle that blew up, the first one. And it was related to O-rings. And uh, as a matter of fact, in all fairness, NSPE, now it's not NSPE, it's one of the other, I think it's Sun, who is one of the other continuing education organizations that you can pay classes. They have a case study for ethics on the uh, challenge of disaster. And it's good reading, even though it's wrong, which is fascinating. Um, you know, I sound so pompous, I say it's wrong, but I happen to know it's wrong. This is just one of those things. Um, um, it's an ethics uh, uh, investigation about um, um, the challenge of disaster. And you read through it, and you ask them, answer a bunch of questions, and that fulfills your one-hour ethics requirement for this. Bottom line is that um, I don't think we should paint the challenge of disaster as an engineering disaster. Um, uh, the, when this happened at the time, there was an engineering friend of mine who said, you know, let's face it, space, walk, space travel is no effing walk in the park. And that's the reality of it. We're really hitting the cutting edge. Difficult decisions get made. Although, on the challenge of disaster, it was pushed by politics. Um, they wanted that space shuttle up because Ronald Reagan was supposed to provide some kind of interview with the teacher in space, which was uh, Krista McAuliffe. McAuliffe, thank you, Krista McAuliffe, who was supposed to do an interview with Reagan in space, and they lit off that candle a little sooner than they should have. Now, all of us go, you know, VW emissions, I don't work for car manufacturers, all of us go, challenge disaster, I'm not doing rockets. Um, the next example, example is brown and tan sugar packets, and this really gets down in the trenches, and this will occur to all of us at some time in our life, although not in this case. I was in New Zealand two weeks ago, 
and we're sitting there with a friend of mine um, in a, a coffee house and we got our, our espressos and in an espresso I like to put brown raw sugar in my espresso. I don't know why, it's just the thing I like to do. So there's a pile of, there's a, a bowl of sugar packets and I grab the brown sugar packet and I shake it and I rip it and I look at it and it says white sugar. The brown sugar packet says white sugar. And I go, well that's weird. So I look at the cup and there's yellow sugar packets too, but generally yellow, you kind of think it's maybe artificial sugar or something like that. So I pick up the yellow sugar packet and it says white, it says brown sugar on it. So they put the, some designer designed sugar packets and that designer decided to, for some God, who knows what reason, to put brown sugar in yellow packets and white sugar in brown packets. Now, that might be called stupid, but it's actually, in my mind, it's unethical. And the reason it's unethical is because that idiot is now making millions and millions of people suffer with the wrong color sugar packets. Now, if you want to, if you want to, no, no this is very interesting because some, the designer might say, well, maybe it's artistic. And I mean, you can make a really good argument for that, that maybe it is artistic. And I can imagine that if I am in a room like this and there's a wall there and there's a big panel, imagine or any wall and it has two sugar packets on it. One is brown and it says white sugar on it and another one is yellow and it says brown sugar on it. It's really good art. It's really good art because it surprises me. It makes me think a little different. But to make, to burden me when having to open the wrong sugar packet in a coffee shop is just not right. And this is important to remember. Do the right thing. You guys are laughing. I'm serious art time. So, uh, the next one is really very, very interesting. And this is a case that um, gets cited in ethics studies, and it's a very important study, no matter who reports it is worth thinking about. This is called the City Group Center. Who's familiar with the City, city Group building? Who's familiar with the City Group problem? Okay, there's a lovely problem. Some of you are, some of you are not. The City Group building is uptown. It's, uh, there's a picture there. And then there's a really lovely story about the real estate buying for it and how a little church held out. And if you look at the second picture, you can see it's, it's on stilts. And the reason it's on stilts is because there's still actually a church underneath there that sold its air rights, but not the, not the building itself. The building gets designed by structural engineer William Le Messier, who um, uh, is very well known, and he designs this building. And it's, it's not a big deal, really. I mean, these stilts look a little weird, but it's not the most difficult thing in the world. But um, these buildings are subject, subject to wind loads, and he did wind load calculations, and he made sure there was sufficient bracing in the building, diagonals is what we call them. And the, um, um, uh, the building goes up, it's uh, pretty much finished, people moving in, and there is an engineering student named Diana Hartley who was doing a study about wind loads, and she called him and said, can I have your data? She gets her date, she gets his data, and she looks at it and she discovers that he never did a calculation for the diagonal wind loads. He only did face on wind loads, not diagonals. And the diagonals were 60 to 70 percent higher, which made the building uh, not strong enough in, in, in shear, essentially. So the, um, um, uh, the diagonals that are in the building were not strong enough. Um, uh, the interesting thing is now that William Le Maché finds out, finds out about this. And he is faced with a horrible dilemma. The building is almost finished. He's a famous structural engineer. What's he going to do? He didn't hesitate. He called his uh, his client, City Group, and said, "I made a mistake. There's a problem, and um, we need to fix the building." And they said, "How bad is it?" He said, "Well, a hurricane will probably knock it down." And um, they said, "Well, hurricane season is going to happen in three months." And he says, "Yes, I know that." And um, the city group, and he worked out a remedial program where they reinforced the diagonals on the building, and they did this while people were in the building at night, and they fixed the whole building. Now, nobody knew about this. This happened in, if I remember correctly, in the early 70s, is that right? And, um, and there was a meeting, very much like a meeting we have tonight, where he did a presentation of structural design, and he told the story in 1986 or 1987, and it became a New York Times story. He was a man who was a licensed professional engineer who knew that his license was on the line, did the right thing, got it sorted out, and in the end, everybody learned. And the most important thing is that we need to pass all of these through, that we need to pass these stories on to everybody. And that is ethics, by the way. Ethics is to learn these stories. So let's go to maritime engineers. It's much more fun. Um, SNAMI has a code of ethics. Um, you know, who has ever read the SNAMI code of ethics? <laughs> well, you, I'm going to make you guys read it right now. 
because this is a continuing education thing. Um, but we have, um, there's another really cool thing in Maritime too, is that we actually have a special professional engineer's license arrangement. This was created in 1992, which is the uh, special deal with the Coast Guard. And um, if you want to see what it's about, it's NAVIC 1092. Um, what it does is the Coast Guard worked out an arrangement where they said professional engineers, if they stamp the drawings for designs that are supposed to be Coast Guard approved, will get preferential treatment. As a matter of fact, we will accept their designs and might never even review them, and you can go ahead and build them if they're stamped with a professional engineer's stamp. This is a, real, a really big step, a really big deal. Uh, the Coast Guard Managed Program did a great job at it, and it actually started the requirement, the requirement is not the right word, it started the uh, tradition of uh, professional engineers' licenses for naval architects and marine engineers. This went on and ended up being an AWAR Text Marine Engineers license that was developed by SNAMI. And if, if I were to pick any program that I think is a great success, it's that one. It really, it really is a wonderful program. Um, um, we designed our own test, and, um, and, and, and I think overall it's been very successful. But we have an additional standard, and the standard is called seaworthiness. Does anybody, can anybody give me a quick definition of seaworthiness? Nobody steps up, and it shouldn't be because lawyers talk about seaworthiness all the time, and it's endless. But the funny thing is that there's actually a very good standard for seaworthiness. Seaworthiness is that standard which would make you, as an engineer, decide that your ch oldest child or youngest child, for that matter, should be able to go on that particular boat on that particular voyage. That's seaworthiness. In other words, I might have my kid cross a creek in a rowboat, but not an ocean in a rowboat. And that's how C ordinance develops and how it's a very flexible standard. So when we get back to standards, we don't have the steel construction code. We have much more complicated things that we have to deal with. We designed for a very ill-defined environment too, of course, which is this this is this damn ocean that just won't let us get away with anything. And uh, our professional ex expertise tends to be very wide-ranging. What I mean by that is that. Um, uh, we are systems engineers, whether we're marine engineers, whether we are naval architects, our job is to pound as much as we can into a particular envelope and to get it to work and to get it to stay afloat. Um, and that requires materials, it requires structures, it requires just about everything, including human factors, which is what um, um, uh, John and I were discussing, that um, um, human factors is a big deal in maritime also. And you can't live on a boat, you can't have a boat. So, and, and what happened is actually, and I, there's an item that says um, master's degree silliness. What happened is that the National Society of Professional Engineers has been pushing for a requirement to have a master's degree to be able to obtain a professional engineer's license. From the um, STAMI point of view, STAMI resisted this very, very strongly. As a matter of fact, it wasn't just STAMI, it was also the Society of Mechanical Engineers that resisted this, and a couple other societies because a master's degree does not make you a great engineer. A master's degree allows you to specialize in something, but the core of it, the real core of engineering, the ethics or the license constraints, what it means to be an engineer has nothing to do with getting a bunch of extra credits in a certain specialty. So the question is, do we need licenses or ethics? Um, uh, my, 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 my point is, we really need ethics, but the licenses help. So now we've got this name, a code of ethics, and it goes a little quicker. We don't have a lot of fine print. Um, and basically, there's a fundamental principles line, and I like it a lot. Um, it was changed recently, and I'll explain to you what it's about. Um, the naval architects, marine engineers, and ocean engineers, or society's professionals, maintain and, and advance the integrity, honor, and dignity of the profession by using their knowledge, experience, and skill for enhancement of human well-being as, and as good stewards of the environment. In other words, we're not encouraged to be good stewards of the environment. We're required to be good students in the environment, which I really like is a wonderful enhancement. Striving to increase the competence of the professions of naval architecture and marine engineering and being honest and impartial and serving with fidelity to the public, their employers, and clients. That by itself, of course, is inherently it is attention, fidelity to the public, their employers, and clients. But we'll discuss that and we'll see that it's actually not all that difficult. Now, there are the specific canons. I'll go back and forth. There's, uh, there's, as you can see, there's 12 of them. A nice dozen, um, and, and we can read them. But I can actually the the, the capitals. They are the short, the, the sort of like the takeaway from it. It says, take the high road, benefit mankind, stay clean, be honest, be discreet, be loyal, 
be transparent, don't double dip, compete fairly, be competent, cooperate, and then the last one that I like best, and I'll read the whole one, the society's professionals shall continue their professional development throughout their careers and shall provide opportunities for the professional development of those naval architects and marine engineers under their supervision. Um, and quite frankly, tonight, in this particular situation, I'd like to add something to that. Um, and it shall provide opportunities for people of all races, all genders, all sexual orientations, all ethnic backgrounds uh, under their supervision uh, for professional development. The point I'm making is that um, this might be our next part of our ethics that we have to spend time looking at. And, um, and I, I hope maybe this will start a discussion in the society. Uh, meanwhile, looking at these things, I have the sense that I'm looking at the Boy Scout um, uh, motto or something like that. Um, and, and it's interesting to look at Boy Scouts because um, I, I both hate and love the, the Boy Scouts. I was a Boy Scout leader in the days that gays were not allowed in the Boy Scouts. And um, at the local level, we happily accepted anybody in any color, any type, anything that happened. Um, meanwhile, at the national level, there was a huge fight going on that we happily ignored. Uh, meanwhile, the pressure has made the Boy Scouts make changes, and the interesting thing is that I think actually the uh, respect for Boy Scouting or Scouting in general has risen simply because of the, the decisions they've made. So, when maritime professionals fails and saves, I mean, we know that we're not perfect, although we're pretty damn good, and I'll prove that in a minute. Um, we have problems. Uh, the Marine Electric and the El Faro and the seawall. The seawall is a Korean issue. Um, that was a modification to the ship that was not properly evaluated, resulted in a loss of stability and capsize. Uh, most deaths, as Rebecca has spent so much time working on, relate to loss of stability. Um, however, the Marine Electric and the El Faro are interesting because the Marine Electric had occurred, in, if I remember correctly, around 1979. And the El Faro happened just a couple of years ago, and it's to me it's shocking and stunning and incredible uh, that there's so many similarities between these two cases, and um, that means that we're not really spending enough time on either our ethics or on the continue, continuous education of our engineers as far as ethics and as far as decision making is concerned. And we have the cost of Concordia, and the cost of Concordia is not an engineering issue until you really realize that the operation of ships is an engineering issue and that training is an engineering issue. And when we go through that and we start to look at that, we'll realize that the uh, accident, the cost of quarter the accident has occurred, was related to a captain who was grandstanding and quite frankly, uh, probably should not have been a captain and probably should have been taken out of the selection process while he was still a junior officer. And if not, should have been taken out of the selection process by the board engineers and the other technical personnel that were supervising him. We have one of the water separators, one of the water separators was an engineering failure that lasted for about 30 years, I won't go into details. And then there's single-handed racing, which I find very interesting because um, I've designed single-handed racing boats, and even worse, I've designed rowboats that people rode from Punta Arena to Antarctica, which I think is probably the pinnacle of unsea worthiness to row a boat through that type of weather. Um, at the same time, when I did it, I, I had a very close understanding with the people doing it. Um, a single-handed rowboat going from Punta Arenas to um, Antarctica uh, could kill the rower, but it's unlikely to kill anybody else. The problem with single-handed racing is that we now have sailboats that will do 25 knots easily, build out a carbon fiber, can easily torpedo another ship and kill all the people when the single-handed sailor is asleep in his bunk. The question is, is that seaworthy? Is that ethical for an engineer to work on? Now we have boy and slat. I won't go into details, but if you type boy and slat on the webs on the internet, you will see he's a young man from Holland who believes that you can recover plastic from the Pacific gyre uh, using floating booms and plastic recovery systems and do this cost effectively. It's absolutely impossible. Now if a young man does something like that, so you say, I appreciate your passion and I like what you're doing. Um, but let's, you know, let's look at the details. However, Boyan Slat has collected millions and millions and millions of dollars in public funding, and he, he's being supported by Delft University in the Netherlands and professors from Delft University. And the question is, how come that when I look at this thing real quickly, I can prove beyond the reasonable doubt, far beyond the reasonable doubt, that his idea is stupid, and how come that there are people there that are sucking basically that $10 million down into their fees uh, simply because they can't? And where are the ethics in that? 
So the next question is, are we still providing proper training to crews and engineers, and especially the latter part engineers, even although I like the idea of crews too, uh, crews being Navy crews, for example, in Fitzgerald, are we still providing proper training to engineers? Um, that is um, a, um, a good question. Uh, we'll get back to it in a couple minutes, and it's kind of hilarious. Um, I, we also do some things very, very well. Uh, mathematically, shipping has fewer fails per ship per nuclear power plant than nuclear power plants. And this might seem weird, but um, there's maybe 500 nuclear power plants in the world, and every 30 years we get a good lick of a nice failure. Um, that gives us a failure rate. There are tens of thousands of ships in the world, and about every year we have a nice disaster. You can look this up, it's about every year there's a disaster that really impacts society. And that really means that ships actually operate more safely than nuclear power plants. So uh, you can be a little smug, and maybe it's a C word in this. If you go out and ship yourself and understand the chance of killing yourself, maybe you pay a bit more attention. Uh, I had a professor who said that driving with a spear strapped to the steering wheel, pointed at your, at your heart, doesn't make you a better driver, but it makes you pay more attention. So direct uh, cause and effect of a profession when it concerns ships, but maybe not systems. And I say maybe not systems as engineers. We sometimes tend to think, well, this widget will stay together, but the question is, what is the widget being used for? And we have to think about that, and that reaches back to the cost of Concordia, reaches back to, well, I make a beautiful ship, but I have a person who is not competent to operate it. What does that mean, and what do I need to do as an engineer? So let's go to some case studies. How much time have I burned up, John? Oh, boy. <laughs> Ten minutes, even. No, I think you set me up. I think I, I don't think I spoke for 40 minutes. All right, case studies. Um, I, I was called in um, to um, I was called in to um, uh, take a look at a semi-factory vessel that was built in the Gulf, and when they launched it, capsized, ended up on its side. We were representing builders, risk underwriters. An attorney asked me to go out and see what's going on. I went out. And I discovered that um, the ship was upright by the time I got there, but they poured about two feet of concrete into the fish holds. Now that made the ship stable, but at the same time the fish holds only were reduced a small amount in volume. If you filled the fish holds, the ship would basically have water on the main deck. And you know fishermen, a fisherman will not stop until his hold is full, so it would basically be a death trap. Um, I went back, told my client about that, who was an attorney, and I said, there's a real problem there. I think I need to go to the Coast Guard. And he said, well, I'll sue you if you go to the Coast Guard because that's not in the best interest of my client, which brought up one of those conflicts that I described before, client, public, et cetera, et cetera, conflict. Um, the attorney was um, a great friend of mine, and I said, well, you have a problem. You're going to sue me because I have a license. I'm a licensed professional engineer. We're going to have a clash of licenses because of codes of ethics. I said, but, um, uh, you know, it's your job. And he said, well, let me settle this thing as quick as possible, then you can go to the Coast Guard. So he settled as quick as possible, and I went to the Coast Guard. I went to the Coast Guard, and I said, there's a ship in the Gulf, and it's a fishing vessel. He said, what is the name? And he looked it up, and he said, no, that's a yacht. And I said, no, it's a fishing vessel. And it turned out the owner listed as a yacht. The reason the owner listed as a yacht is because the... Um, uh, if you have a semi-factory vessel, it's Coast Guard inspected. In other words, you can take additional crew on board to the factory operation of the fishing vessel, it becomes Coast Guard inspected, and the owner wants to do everything it could to hide it as being a factory vessel. So, protect the environment. Who is familiar with Moon Carusa? It was a great salvage job. The weirdest, the weirdest trip to the far side I've ever been on. And the ship broke in two. It was on the beach in an area where there was very sensitive wildlife. There was a bird called the dusty plover, only six nesting pairs on the west coast, and they were all within five miles of the ship. The ship had uh, hundreds of tons of fuel oil in the double bottom tanks. And broke in two, some oil spilled, not a lot. And it was sitting there, bow up on the beach. Um, I was a salvage naval architect. Uh, we make it very expensive to get it off, and one day I find out that I have to call the crew off the ship because uh, they were going to blow the ship up. I said, what do you mean blow the ship up? And they said, well, we have an explosives team come in that's going to put shaped hard charges on the top of the tank tops. 
loaded tank top shots, which, which will then expose the fuel oil in the double bottoms, and then we'll use napalm to set it on fire. From an engineering point of view, that kind of beats the Primera no nocera thing, which means the first do no harm. And so far that I have a ship on the beach, my hull is still intact, but it's sitting on the beach and it can start cracking any time. And when it cracks, the only thing I can float the ship on is the double bottom. But if when I blow it out, it explodes, I have nothing to work with. So it really was not a very smart idea from a salvage point of view. On top of that, it was a very easy solution to, to deal with burning the fuel. The ship was bowed up in the beach. We could remove the manhole covers, both the double in the tank tops, and let the oil flow into the cargo hold and set it on fire with napalm. If it burned, we could keep going. If it didn't burn, we could stop. Um, there's a problem. I talked to the salvage mass. Salvage mass says, let's go to the qualified individual. We went to the qualified individual, and the, not the qualified individual, sorry, the incident commander, who was the person in charge of decision making. And he said, what is this about? He said, well, we're going to blow the ship up. And I said, well, let me explain why not. He looks at me and he says, well, yeah, I got a good point. And I said, so we're going to change the plan. He says, no, no, we're going to do this. And I said, well, in that case, from a license point of view, I have to go one step higher. Who's above you? He said, well, I just got off the phone with Al Gore, so you get to talk to Al Gore. And at that time, actually, Al Gore made the decision to do this, to do this burning. I um, But this actually stopped me in my tracks. I, um, I chickened out. I didn't go on. I didn't say, well, then I need to talk to Al Gore. I kind of said, well, Al well, Gore is involved in his whole politics at that stage. I might as well, you know, keep my head down. Uh, fortunately, the first one, the burn didn't work. They blew out the double bottoms. But fortunately, the hull didn't breach, so we managed to get the ship off. We sank it offshore somewhere near the Pacific, plastic gyre or something like that. And, uh, and the case was done. So it all turned out all right. But if it didn't turn out all right, out all right it would have been an interesting discussion. Did you still have stuff? I do. OK. So um, uh, case 33 is bribes, anyone? Uh, bribery is um, something that uh, has occurred in shipping for many years. Um, we had a junior engineer who um, ran into a bribery problem, and, and um, it was fun because he came in the office after this occurred on a Saturday morning. He was given money without realizing he was given money. It actually was given to him in a coffee, cu coffee cup. He realized he had money in a coffee cup. He, um, yeah, on a Saturday morning, he did a job on a Saturday morning, and he shows up on Monday in my office and said, you know, I, have a, I want to discuss this. And I said, oh, that's hilarious. And meanwhile, he had been sweating it for all day Saturday, but um, one of my partners is Jim Dolan of ABS. Um, he has seen more bribes that had to be returned than probably there is money in the national budget. And um, it's very simple. A bribe shows up, you just disclose, and you go on. So what we did is we, um, we called a client and said, you know, we have one of the junior engineers, he ended up with his money. We explained why, and the really came down to exactly the same reason that I chickened out in front of Al Gore. Um, the money was given to him. He found out in the car that he had the money at that stage. He said, what am I going to do? Didn't go back to the guy and give it back to the guy. He just went home. Um, uh, we, um, we called the client. The client was about as unshocked as you've ever heard a client. And, um, and he said, we'll send it back to the guy. He said, go ahead, send us a copy of the letter. That was the end of the deal. It was actually not the end of the deal. First of all, it was not a big bribe. Um, and, and, and when he sent it back with the note to the person who had given the money, this person was shocked to hell. And he had the courage to call us, actually. He called us and said, this is a horrible mistake. I felt that your man came out on a Saturday to deal with this issue, and I wanted to reward him for that. And I realized I shouldn't have done that. I don't know if he meant that or not, it doesn't matter, but the best part is that actually if you come to your client and say, the bribe was off and we have returned it, your client respects you much, much, much more. And there's almost a freebie, it's like one of the best things that can happen on a clear day, that somebody offers a bribe, you go to your client and say, we offer a bribe, but we hand it back, and the client will go, well, this guy is not bribable, now I can trust him with more stuff. So we go to the next one. And I will go very short on this, and this is a subject by itself. I testify on the road very often uh, in, in various cases. Um, what I find shocking is that there are a lot of engineers out there who write technical reports thinking that the rest of the world is stupid. And that is the biggest mistake you can make in life. Now what is also fun is as a forensic engineer is that occasionally you make a mistake in a report. 
And there's nothing better than showing up at the deposition and to say, before I will start the deposition, I'd like to correct this one thing or that one thing in my report. Now, hopefully it doesn't change the conclusions because you will look like a fool, but maybe make a small calculation area error, error and it doesn't change the conclusion. And it actually adds a lot to the credibility of your report. It's very important. And um, again, if I make a mistake, where do I admit it? Right away, as soon as you can. So a um, snaming one's very clever for me on the case. I was involved in the oily water separators. There was a snaming member who very strongly disagreed with what I thought about oily water separators. This person, um, uh, behind my back, not to my face, started defaming me and, um, and, and started saying things about me that were not you know, true. Um, not things like, I think he's an idiot. I, that, that is fine by me. But he was saying that I was in a pocket of special interest, which was patently untrue. And, um, yeah, um, um, this came to my attention. People were telling me this person is doing this, and instead of um, instead of um, uh, addressing this myself, I called Snamey because I knew he was a Snamey member, and it was very simple. I called Snamey and said it's a code of ethics. So he's not allowed to do that, and they said don't worry about it. We'll take care of it, and they did, and it stopped, and it went away. Now it's very interesting because you're allowed to disagree with your professional. Uh, uh, professional society uh, members, um, and you're supposed to actually, as a matter of fact, this is encouraged, and it's called peer review. Peer review is where you go on the record and you write a discussion on paper. So if any of you guys hate my guts, have any problem with me, write it off, issue it to the paper chairman of SNAMI or this asking you, John will happily take discussions, and then um, we, we can work our way through it. However, the view it behind somebody's back is not the way it's done. <coughs> Mental exhaustion. Um, the, the crux of this is that I was in a salvage job where we worked out a very complex um, uh, discharge arrangement on a leaking tanker. Now the ship was stable, it was completely stable, we had the discharge arrangement figured out. It was right near harbor, by the way. And um, uh, we sent it to the Coast Guard by fax in those days. And the Coast Guard came back right away and said, We like your plan, go ahead to the berth and discharge. However, while we were developing the Discharge arrangement. Um, me as salvage naval architect, and with the chief mate who was running the loader, you know the thing with the little dials. Um, it became apparent that he was no longer uh, functioning, and in, in to the extent that he was so tired he couldn't remember what he did the moment before he dialed the dial. And, um, and so I said to the, I went to the captain and said, you know, we will order birth and discharge, but I really don't think this is the. Uh, the best thing to do because the chief mate is exhausted. He said, I don't know when you last slept anyway. He said, oh, it's been about 48 hours. I said, well, to take it to the berth to start a very difficult discharge that uh, could result in errors and we're perfectly safe here at the berth. Why don't we stay? And he asked, well, I can go to my boss and tell him that, but then I'll lose my job. Now, the Coast Guard was aboard the vessel. There was a little young female lieutenant was on the ship with a big cell phone in those days, big one, you know, like that. And, um, I said, can I talk to you on the bridge wing? We went on the bridge wing. And I said, um, you know, you've never heard this from me, but I'm just wondering if you ever thought about how tired everybody is before we go to the bird. And she goes, yeah, actually, yeah. People must be very tired, see, especially the captain and the chief mate. And um, I said, don't you think it would be a good idea to, um, to have everybody get eight, eight hours sleep before we go to the bird? And she caught on right away. She was very smart. She knew right away. Went, yeah, I think that's a really good idea. I said, you're going to suggest it to the boss, right? She goes, that's what I'll do. And so I walked off the bridge wing. She called the boss on Governor's Island those days. And five minutes later, we got a fax that said, taking into account that this will be a difficult discharge. We want everybody to have a good night's sleep. The ship is safe at anchor. We're staying at anchor for a day. Very small thing, ethical though. Um, very important to get it right. And, and, and it takes time sometimes to think your way through that. Don't take no for an answer too quick. Forgery. Um, long story short, there was a confusion in our office, and a Greek ship owner, it was a Greek ship owner, changed a local from a little bit of a storm to a big storm, thinking this is what our senior partner, Harry already suggested by saying, well, if it were really heavy weather, it would be an easy claim. The law book ended up at the underwriter surveyor, and Harry found out in the Whitehall Club in those days that the underwriter surveyor was on the impression it was a very big storm. 
So in every context, the ship owners is what you do. So well, you suggested to me that I should change the law. He said, I didn't suggest any of that stuff. Communication error. So I had a call the owner I was being sent that was a horrible communication error. Um, this local was incorrect, and uh, it might have been through a cultural difference, but the um, local should say force seven instead of force ten. And um, the amazing thing is the claim flew anyway. So again, you come out with the truth, sometimes the wind goes in your back. And uh, this is my very favorite in this regard. It's not an engineer who failed here, but a single skin tanker. And, and this happened in Portland, I would say around 1992 or 1993, I was going through a bridge. The pilot, very highly respected pilot, both professionally in the community, you know, he was a great guy, um, was uh, piloting a ship through Cessna Helmsman goes, Helmsman goes uh, you know, hard, hard starboard, and he meant hard port. Ship yanks the um, bridge abutment out, gets stuck on the abutment, rips the single skin out, huge oil spill in Port of Harbor, truly huge oil spill. Really nasty oil spill. Um, Coast Guard comes about and says what happened. And the pilot said, I'm sorry, it wasn't my fault. I said hard starving instead of hard port. Most amazing thing about all of this is that the pilot never got a license, pro a license punishment or anything like that. Made a mistake. The best part about it is the town didn't even care because he was an honest man. He said what happened and nobody really got upset. They cleaned up the, the port. The oysters were filtered out over the course of the year. They took some oysters out. There was things that needed to be done. But the guy retired 10 years later, and again, is a very highly respected pilot. This is very interesting in itself because anybody can make a mistake. And of course, the two types of mistakes is mistakes that are waiting to happen and mistakes. And we have to see the difference between it. The cost of Concordia captain was a mistake waiting to happen, where we as engineers had to step in and look at this ethically. While an actual mistake can happen to anybody, including us, even the most ethical engineers. So here comes the most interesting thing. This is where I'll pretty much wrap up. Um, the National Society of Professional Engineers published a magazine called BE, which stands for Professional Engineer, I guess. And they have articles in there, and they have different issues. One issue they had about sustainable energy, which is really funny because they only encourage people to do sustainable energy. And, I swear, the one was the last people to talk about any subject. It's amazing. I mean, so now we're talking about sustainable energy. There's the magazine that date is 2011. And there's an article there by a gentleman named um, Donald. Well, I'll go to the next page. It says, why we need rational selection of energy projects. You got that, right? Why we need rational selection of energy projects. The guy's name is Donald Wolfinghoff, P.E. The circle section says a compelling example is photovoltaic electricity generation. Its energy return ratio is less than one, one to one. Therefore, in its present state, it cannot be an energy source for the future. A major new development is needed to make it viable. Energy return ratio means that it is the ratio of the amount of energy to make a device and the amount of energy that the device can collect or produce. The solar panel is much more than one to one. As a matter of fact, very conservatively, it's eight to one, and there was that in 2011. So here we have an article on Professional Engineers Magazine, the magazine that is the center core of ethics, the center core of professional engineers, the center core of licensing, the center core of lobbying. It is the National Society of Professional Engineers that published an article that's written by a professional engineer that says that the energy return ratio of photovoltaic cells is less than 1.1. It's categorically wrong. This is not a matter of opinion. It's wrong. Now my daughter Hannah is sitting there because she was in the middle of this thing. So I won't go for full confession because otherwise she'll pull me out. This pissed me off some of fears. I mean, it really got me mad. And so I held back and I wrote a very cool, very cool article to the editor of the magazine that says, um, Engineer Wolfing offered an article that says rational selection of energy projects and he makes some categorical mistake, which is actually not an error. It is something that misstates something that really could affect policy at any level. This article will be quoted by people and by people for the wrong reasons. This needs to be corrected. We need a correction on this article. I get a letter back from it. First, I get no answer. Then I get an answer back. I send a reminder. I get an answer back. So, well, it's a difference of opinion. You have the right to 
too late a letter to be added to, to publish to, to, to provide your point of view. I said, there's no point of view issue. This is wrong. It's plain wrong. I said, this went on for a bit, and the tone got higher and higher, and they became more defensive. At a certain stage, I said, all you have to do is give me your license um, state for, for engineer wolfing off. Just tell me, he's a PE. You write it down, he's a PE. Tell me where his license. I'll put a license complaint in. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. So I actually went through all the state license listings, trying to find where this guy was there. I never found him. So this, um, this went on. I didn't give up. Unfortunately, my daughter Anna arranged a compromise to some extent, I think. What, what, did you do that? Somebody, did I go to the photovoltaics people? And he became one of your professors. It was something like that, something really weird. But I went to the Photovoltaic Institute, the National Photovoltaic Institute, or whatever it's called, something like that. And there was a Columbia engineer professor who said, yeah, this is categorically wrong. He'd done all the research on energy return ratios. And the magazine allowed him to write an article in a later issue that used the correct numbers, but was not allowed to state the early numbers were patently incorrect. Okay, so this is the National Society of Professional Engineers. Tell me, ask me how much I respect them. The story has a follow-up. The story has a follow-up. And the follow-up is hilarious. And this being reported, by the way, so it gets better. So the follow-up is hilarious. The, um, uh, I was putting this paper together. This happened in 2011. So I wonder what happened to Engineer Wolfinghoff. So I Googled him. Guess what? No one says he's a PE. <laughs> that itself is pretty interesting. So, uh, conclusions. But well, when the mistakes get made, it's very important to remember. There are accidents and there are accidents waiting to happen. Communicate. It's so important to communicate. I screwed up the communications with NSBE, but if an organization is evil, you might not be able to win anyway. And quite frankly, I want to go back to that NSBE thing. It's laden with attorneys who make ethics decisions. And I wouldn't be surprised that when I raise the subject about the guy's state of licensure, that they ask this guy, and then they said, oh my God, we're even going to have to admit that somebody in the National, in the National Society of Professional Engineers magazine is writing on the PE moniker as not a PE. And they decided to just simply pay for it and show it down. I don't have the answers to it. Maybe someday I will. You don't need a license to be an ethical engineer, but it can be a great tool to make your point. And I gave you some examples of that. Criminal convictions used to require a guilty mind. Unfortunately, today, sometimes honest mistakes get turned into criminal convictions. The best way to stay away from the problem is to owe up as quick as you can if you made a mistake. We'll get back to the other, the other type of mistake later. Lying to government officials is generally a crime. So when the Coast Guard shows up, do yourself a favor. Speak the truth. The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Or let's think in terms of the fastest possible disclosure. When do I get this out? Only total honesty can save you when you make a mistake. If you're not totally honest, you will lose continually. Often, some type of intermediate can assist in resolving the matter. This is very important. If you really feel you have a problem, go to somebody you can trust and run it by them and try to figure out what the best solution is and do it quick. Don't wait until it's too late. Engineering ethics and lawyers are a little, very little in common, and I just explained that. By the way, I don't hate lawyers. My son is a lawyer. Um, uh, I don't, really. I really don't. And as a matter of fact, I, I go one step further. I think many very difficult issues are pounded out through law, whether it's VW emission problems, whether it is, uh, you know, uh, whether it's racism, all kinds of things. It all gets pounded out, but it's very messy. Engineers actually have a somewhat cleaner ethic, and we sometimes can solve things faster and better. Now ask yourself, did I break the law, or did I make a mistake? You have to learn off for the first one. For the mistake, how can your community sort this thing out? Now there's good news. Doing the right thing makes you sleep better. There's more space and a better view on the highway. Practice makes perfect. Police yourself and police other engineers. Okay, sometimes you can do this by a gentle word and say, you know, you really shouldn't go there. And if you consider the same code of ethics, you can go on from there. Or you can even start a discussion about it in the most general terms that says, you know, is this ethical? What do you think about it? It takes courage, but owning up to a mistake. Owning is it owing or owning? I don't know. I think it's owning up, right? 
owning up to a mistake that others may have tried to hide, very often will much enhance your professional reputation. So our ethics always makes more money in the long run, which is amazing. We will really stick with your ethics. My company's been around for 140 years, boy. I've had been hammered by ethics by my elders, and uh, it makes life very easy. As an engineer, licenses are not getting paid for serving humanity, and the environment is a unique opportunity. Don't waste it. And if you do it all well, if you all do it well, it's a change I made. Now. If you all do it well, we will all get paid more. Thank you very much. <laughs> so any questions? Come on. Really? You know what I mean? So I must have messed up. Thank you, John. I'm, uh, I'm discussing um, uh, the engineers within uh, companies. So right. they don't have professional engineers. So I, I didn't disagree with anything you said about the benefit of having professional but then again, in looking at this, and I'm not sure I connected to, but uh, in those cases, they have they, they look towards if somebody makes a mistake or there are issues, it's a product liability. It's not understood. It. So that it comes under the insurance either the company has or the company pays out of its pocket for the disaster. Whereas on the professional engineering side, then it, it's more on the services side. And the, 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 the actually. Actually, the, and I'm not a lawyer, but the, but the for functioning on liability issues and product and engineer liability issues, there's no difference between mistake. <coughs> Excuse me. There's no difference in making mistakes as a professional corporation or as a corporation. So if I screw up as a car manufacturer with uh, regard to a airbag issue, or if I screw up as a structural engineer with regard to the design of a skyscraper, the, 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 actual, the actual law is not that different. It simply means that did I make a mistake or was it a mistake waiting to happen? The mistakes waiting to happen is when liability comes in. And the best example of that is <clears throat> if you as an engineer become aware of a flaw in anything you're doing and this results in the pro and you don't make take corrective action and this results in your problem, you're hung, just short of being drawn on quarter. But if an engineer, and you see there's a problem, and you right away engage in a, uh, in a solution to the problem, and there could be many different things. It could simply starting a research project that is going at a reasonable pace. It could be the analysis of the risk, not a commercial risk, of the risk to life, that says, you know, what is the risk of this car flipping, for example, stuff like that. And if that still stays in the background, you have some time to fix it. If you don't have the time to fix, you have to do something. So the point I'm making is that um, as a professional engineer or within a corporation, you're stuck with the same burden. You have to stay, take the same action. And I'm telling you, the moment somebody points out something that's wrong, take action. If you don't take action, you're going to get hung up. You will get hung up. And it's, as I said, we're damned. Uh, we can't hide our mistakes forever. They're going to show up. Uh, helpful? Yes, sir. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, if I could, just relay one experience in my life where <coughs> ethics uh, came into play. Now that I look back in retrospect. But uh, we had a ship that was docked in Oakland, fully loaded with containers, getting ready to sail. And as we normally do before we sail, we test the steering gear. Chief Engineer calls the office. He's in Oakland, Bury, New Jersey. He says, uh, Joe, we got a problem. When I run the steering gear and change direction, I hear a clunking noise. So I said, okay, Chief, uh, and it's been a while since we've been on dry dock. Can somebody go down and check the rudder stop while you're turning the steering gear to see if the rudder stop has maybe possibly come loose? So uh, sure enough, chief engineer goes down, takes a look at it. He's calling a walkie-talkie. First, he's making the maneuvers with the steering gear, and the steering gear, as he operates the steering gear, rudder stop starts to turn, rudder doesn't turn, <laughs> rudder starts to turn. So obviously, we have a problem with the rudder stop. 
Now, here's the question as an engineer. We know there's a problem. We've got a ship fully loaded with cargo. It's supposed to depart in about two hours. What do we do? Okay, so the first thing we did, discuss this in house, I said, okay, here's our dilemma. I believe the rudder stock nut is coming loose. We've got to tighten the rudder stock nut. So everybody gets engaged, the ship's going to be delayed, customers get notified, and we go and take care of business. We get a barge and we cut access and tight turn up the rudder stock is coming loose. We drive up the rudder in place at the dock, tighten up the nut. And as all this is going on, there's more internal discussions going on. V, again, as the engineer, realizing that the rudder stock is integral to the steering gear. If the rudder stock fails, we have no steering gear. We have no replacement for the rudder stock. So again, standing up and saying, hey, uh, if this problem occurred, then the rudder stock has some damage. We need to investigate the rudder stock. At that point, uh, believe it or not, this is the kind of power that you have as an engineer. The company said, okay, this makes sense. Well, let's find a shipyard. Now, what did that mean? That meant a big burden for me and my team to go find a shipyard in an emergency that we can get a ship to and eventually get this rudder stock removed. And when we did, sure enough, we found the keyway was cracked, the key was cracked, and uh, we had to do extensive well repair. It took us another 35, we took the ship out of the service for a wonderful trip. But my point, the point of the discussion is, you know, and this goes to exactly the last thing you mentioned, Rick. As engineers, we have that responsibility. There are lives on board of that ship. That ship could have had a problem in heavy weather, and they could have cracked the rudder stock, possibly lost the rudder. And then we have a large problem. So again, uh, the seriousness of it, I think, is important. And I think the powerful you know, knowledge that we have as engineers and naval architects when we see a dilemma, stand up, communicate, communicate intelligently, get it out there, and make a difference, save some lives, and potentially. Yeah. I, I love the example, Joe, because you're in court right there about four or five concepts in this whole thing. First of all, port engineers, or is it port engineering is an extremely responsible job. You're making these risk decisions continually. It's very bad, you're under economic pressure, you're under time pressure. And every now and then, you really have to step up and say, we're going to deal with this. Um, this is central to the El Faro and uh, Marine uh, Electric discussion. <clears throat> the other thing is that it's not just the engineers, it's also the leadership of Bubba that makes a point. And if you're working as an engineer for a company and you don't consider it to be ethical, a company, you should head for the hills because you've got to be holding the back. And um, in Sealand, Joe referred to Sealand. Um, the CNN was a very dynamic, very technically aggressive company that uh, was had something going on that was truly deeply interesting on a technical level. But the thing that CNN was always, they always managed the risk. No matter what happened, they managed the risk. Whether they were yam or diesels or were throwing connecting rods, or at the very least, we told the crew, don't stand next to these big engines. So the connecting rods they fly into the legs. And, and, and went on from there. And that's really what I mean, went on from there. And, and we really manage this on a risk level. And this is very important. Well, the other thing I want to add is, uh, is that the most important thing about engineering is stories. And we have a lot of stories to tell. We've got to tell a lot of stories. And we need to talk about the code of ethics and engineering that says we have to train the next generation. That comes down to telling stories. So it's not just that uh, we have to tell stories. We have to try to tell them in a good way, too. And when I was at King's Point, I was telling the students that I'm a son of a son of a sailor, and my father and grandfather would tell bullshit stories, what they call them. But all these stories that are moral, and the moral was sort of like, yeah, man, so and so, man, the can clean off, man. Well, you should have seen the blood, it was everywhere. But in that story, there was always a reason why his arm came off that told me not to put my arm there. And these things are very, very important. And, and any story that anybody can contribute is worth listening to. And I really appreciate it, Joe, because we. We and I have gone through a ton of these, and we know that stepping up to the game, because we've done so many of them, stepping up to the game makes you get out of dodge. 
and we actually get out of that and dodge without feeling bad about it too. Any more questions? Well, I want to thank you very much. It was really wonderful. Thank you.